Okay, so now we get a chance to talk to an entrepreneur whose name is Geeta Vallabhanini and we're going to talk to you about your journey. What are the first three things that you've learned uh, being an entrepreneur in the last four or five years? Right, so I came to entrepreneurship through a, a journey of multiple ways in a way. Um, so I started in India. Um, I have a chemical engineering background and I switched over to computer science when I came here um, to get my master's. And I started working at Sun Microsystems um, and I worked on the Solaris kernel and compiler back in really super uh, technical system stuff. Um, but part of that um, uh, time at Sun, I, I had mentors from various business units who advised me to take advantage of my, not only my technical smarts, but sort of like the people smart. Uh, I can sit across from someone and communicate really comfortably and uh, communicate ideas. Um, so it's a, it's a rare skill in if you take uh, core engineers. So I um, switched over to the business parts of the house uh, and I worked for various different smaller companies and eventually um, worked on, uh, hit upon my own idea and that through sort of, you know, existential questions one asks themselves as they're going through life. And I, um, it was very clear I, need, I wanted to take a risk and jump out and start um, start something on my own uh, and at that time cloud was a proven success and mobile was just taking off and uh, my idea was to bring the cloud to the to the mobile devices. So what were some of the thought processes that helped you take that leap of faith uh, leaving a cushy job and then jumping into something unknown? Right. Um, so I was just actually describing this. Um, I read quite a bit. And if you read philosophy and sort of like books that make you question the point of life, uh, you, you know, there's certainly only one thing that you should be afraid of, which is death, which is the final thing that happens, right? Other than that question, life should be about uh, questioning and veering off the path that's defined for you. Um, and also, I think some of us are born naturally with a restless soul, and it takes exploring and um, figuring out what, what else is out there that I don't know about. So that's, uh, that's one thing. But I have to say, though, um, um, if you are going to start a company, make sure you at least have some money in your bank, right? Because for the first one year or two years, uh, just assume that you're either going to make very little money or no money at all. I mean, I haven't taken salary for almost three years. So I had to, you know, you have to last on that um, unless you're raising money out of the gate and, and, you know, you have investment that you can take a good salary on. Um, but true risk taking is just assuming that you're not going to make any money for a while. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now, being an entrepreneur, I know life is uh, not always that smooth and you go through these bumps. How do you fight uh, internal conflict when you've hit one of those bumps and you don't know whether you should just let go or keep going? And how do you go? What do you tell your mind when you hit those moments? Oh, it's actually you hit the bumps every day. Uh, it's part of being uh, being part of a startup. Um, but you have enough motivation and fire within you that keeps you getting at it, right? A lot of the entrepreneurs uh, are persistent or stubborn people. They don't ever want to turn back um, uh, from a challenging situation. But there is a trick, though, um, because you could be pursuing the wrong idea stubbornly. Uh, so you have to have the checks and balances in you. Um, that's where customer validation plays a key role. If you are gaining traction with your product, but hitting bumps that are execution and finance and people, stick with it, solve those problems. But if customers are coming back to tell you your product does not work or it's not something they don't need, you need to rethink and pivot and change. So it's a it's an interesting journey. Now, did you have a mentor in this or uh, it came to you naturally? So I think it, a lot of it is nature. Um, inherently you are that person um, but mentors play a huge role I mean think about our development as a mammal we are born with certain traits but if they are not fostered and uh, and shown away we don't develop into a full human being fully functional human being the same thing with uh, I think entrepreneurs too you have a, a natural propensity and a tendency towards it but if you don't have the mentors um, you can quickly burn out. And these mentors are 
they are connections that last a long time. Uh, people think about building a network, like a shallow network of many people, but you truly need a core network of people who have done this, um, who can actually talk to you and say, yeah, we've been through this and here's how it's going to go. Um, so yeah, it's important. So where do you get your inspiration from? I mean, it's so hard to keep going unless you are really inspired by that thing and what is that thing? So at the core of my being, I am um, a curious, ambitious and compassionate person who likes people. Um, so I wake up and there are certainly tough days in the journey and it's hard to wake up to those days, but you do because you're a uh, you know, curious person to see how this is going to play out, ambitious and you want to make this a success. And there are other people who invested in this because they signed up. I recruited them. So I have an obligation to get up and keep going at it and work with them and, and make this a success. You mentioned success. How do you define success? That's a really good um, good conversation. Uh, I actually talked to one of my mentors about this too. Success to me is not monetary. It is. I mean, we're all after making money so, uh, so that we come out, out of this and we can do other greater things. Um, I actually, interesting enough, I ask um, my teammates who join the team this question. I say, just assume that this will be a failure because nine out of 10 startups either end in death or mediocrity, right? Not everyone has huge success. So if you assume the company is going to be a failure monetarily, what do you get out of it? right? So the answers could be, well, you know, I am right now doing this and I would love to jump into this so that we are on the cutting edge of mobile and enterprise software and cloud. So my skill set will be different. And personally, for me, it's been incredible growth opportunity. Uh, I've learned um, how to work with the most limited resources and connect with people and walk into C-level executive suites and be very comfortable presenting to them. So as long as you're measuring that progress, um, both individually and for a company, um, you set up with a product goal and you keep achieving that with measurable steps. That's what's success to me because if you define it to be that elusive uh, he, building a huge company and monetary thing that doesn't happen by the way immediately it's a you know if, especially if it's and an enterprise constantly struggle that exactly. maybe you're not succeeding exactly so that's absolutely my point right because it's a marathon think of it as a marathon and watch right because after you hit the 20 mile mark you just need to focus on the next step otherwise you won't last that's my that's my definition Okay. Now, you worked in India and you worked over here. What was the biggest adjustment that you had to make internally to be able to accommodate both? So, I did not actually work in India. Um, I graduated from India, but, you know, I am an in, um, from Indian society. Um, you know, I was always a bit of a misfit back home, too. So, my family, my father and mother are farmers and they're barely high school graduates. But one thing was pretty uh, interesting was they were well-read, my dad, um, and they encouraged reading. And apparently, my family has a history of being revolutionary thought, thought leaders. And you went along with it. <laughs> yeah, I went along with it. And um, I always spoke up. And I got in trouble because of that. Um, and I was, I was a bit of a, sort of a misfit and an individualist. Um, so when I came here to Silicon Valley, I think I found a, a little place that I fit in, right? I, um, and here too, this is a great uh, environment that fosters it. But in terms of adjustments, um, I think Eastern philosophy versus Western philosophy are, if you look to the to the core of it is it actually same right while expressing your individuality recognize you are connected to other people so if you get to that level it's the same but the mode of operation external mode of operation is different right in india you try to not make too many waves and you you know family comes first society comes first before it's your expression uh, since I already struggled with it, it was a little bit more of a seamless transition for me. Um, but I, I struggle when I go back home because um, I like speaking up really comes to me. And I get, so for example, this April I was in India 
and a power went out um, because of some storm and my father is on the farm and we didn't have power for two days and the guy finally shows up like you know as if nothing happened and he still took bribe and I wanted to lash out at him but you know if I do my father is going to suffer <laughs> so things like that I struggle with like you know I think our our generation that came after us is changing in India I think things will get um, better over time uh, and I think they are more expressing themselves individually not in terms of family so all of those things will definitely change well as a woman and an entrepreneur I think I could ask you this that did you feel differently any time being in a room of man yeah what, what was it like so to me my natural mode of operation and maybe because I read a lot um, I walk into a room I belong the fact that I'm a woman, I'm a, you know, I'm a brown woman, uh, a Indian woman, all of that is not even at the forefront of my brain. Um, but sometimes it does pop out. Um, but I am blind to it. You can't unsettle me by just placing me in whatever your stereotypes are. But if it's explicitly expressed, I deal with it two ways. One is um, I assess the situation, right? can I handle this diplomatically? I do. Uh, and if I can't, I speak out. And then, uh, and also I think there's the other thing about um, how prominently this, is this a business conversation? Do I need to close this deal, right? So you factor all of this in and measure your responses. But I am someone by nature, not very, I'm stoic. Like, you know, you can't rattle my, my being easily. Um, so I deal with that. And, you know, sometimes you just have to let people go pick and choose battles, right? Like um, that person is not going to make a difference in, your, in the bigger scheme of things. What are some of the strengths uh, that you can point out as a woman? Um, I had a man does not have. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I always hesitate about this question because the argument can easily be made the other way around, which has been made a lot. So men are good at this, women are good at this. I would rather want to approach this as, I mean, clearly there are some neurological differences in our brains, but we are both wonderfully capable, you know, uh, both genders are wonderfully capable. Um, so, yeah. Men are really loving this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> because I am yet to meet, meet someone who says that we are both wonderfully made. They either think the men folks are superior um, and the women no, are superior. No, I think that's the wrong thing, right? You can't say one is superior because that argument could be easily, uh, you know, used by the other side. Which is why I always refrain to say we bring different perspectives to the table. Um, and I think one of the things is we listen more and we're more um, accommodating of ideas. Um, that's actually a good thing. Um, but I don't know if that's the strength because I know men who are good listeners. One of my mentors is an amazing human being, uh, is a man. So yeah, I mean, I know I didn't really answer your question, but that's my take. I that's my take too. <laughs> right? <laughs> I, I just argued with a lady uh, just before you came that, you know, equality is not my thing because we are not equal. And why do we fight for equality? Because when we do that, we are already assuming we are not equal. And exactly. why do I have to compete with another man? I compete with another woman or myself or living my life to the fullest. So uh, tell me if you have to leave our viewers with how to be the best entrepreneur and what keeps you going, what drives you and the thing, top three things that you have to keep in your mind mm -hmm. when you hit those paths. Right. So top three things. One is always know who you are. Don't ever lose sight of that because sometimes, you know, your identity gets intertwined with what you're doing, but there is a wonderfully complex identity that cannot be defined. So know who you are. That will always keep you going. Two, know why you're doing what you're doing, right? Because it's so easy to get caught up like something is not working and uh, according to plan, but that's not the, the small detail is not why you're doing what you're doing. So know the why. There's a wonderful TED Talk by Simon Sinek, and he talks about the essential um, nature of leadership. Uh, you know, he asks you, ask the question, why am I doing this? I'm doing this because I would have been utterly miserable in a big corporation. I'm doing this because I'm a risk taker and I enjoy this uncertainty. So always think of that and then the small stuff disappears. Three, 
always know that it's a team, not just you. So behind this, um, and they are putting in effort, their time, and they're taking a risk. So make sure you keep that in perspective in the decisions that you are taking. So if you had to make one change in this world, apart from doing the company that you're doing, what would that be? Oh boy, um, you're asking the wrong person about that. <laughs> you're all capable of making that one change. Right. And, or we dream of making that one change or we want to make one change. Right. No, the reason I, I laugh at that, I read so much philosophy um, and I'm, I'm just reading Myth of Sisyphus by uh, Albert Camus and he talks about in the bigger scheme of things, if you think about the universe and multiverse and parallel universes, this is just playing out. You can't really change anything. <laughs> but <laughs> I'm not going to take that dry philosophical view. But if you're I, cosmic dust, right. that word I heard okay. recently and it stuck to me. <laughs> you're cosmic dust, dust. <laughs> right? But you know, um, but it's a wonderful thing to think about too. If that's so humongously complex. We are here experiencing all of this, so striving for something better is inherently human too um, and central to our existence. So um, let me take a shot at that. If I uh, change one thing, I would change educational opportunities. You know, I would, I would actually um, take three things as fundamental rights for human beings. Education, healthcare, and free, free press. If you embrace these um, ideals, I think humanity and societies prosper and produce um, wonderful human beings that are compassionate and progressive and informed. But I don't think about the uh, universe too much is because I want to feel the power and I think this is it. Okay. This is the universe and I have all the power to make a change and that's if, what I go by. Right. But if you think about the bigger picture too, it sort of like gives you a wonderful perspective um, that even though you are such a small being, there is a struggle to make meaning out of it. And that can add a, a, a different dimension to, to, to this. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. This was wonderful talking to you.